Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I seemed to come back from a deep, dark hole to find myself in a room that I'd seen somewhere before, but in my dazed condition I couldn't remember where or when. A tube was stuck up my nose, which I found uncomfortable and the noise of voices brought my mind more into focus. I recognized that of my wife demanding something from someone in a white coat. How is he? What happened to him? She was asking. I felt a moment of hostility toward her but couldn't recall why I was mad at her. The white-coated figure responded, At the present time, we aren't sure what his problem is. We'll be doing a series of tests in the morning to determine if there is any damage to his heart, but we'll keep him in the ICU tonight and monitor his condition. Right now we're getting ready to sedate him so he rests comfortably tonight. We'll continue him on oxygen. I felt a prick in my arm, which felt constrained somehow, and in a few minutes I seemed to slide back into my comfortable dark hole. When I woke again it was morning and a nurse was adjusting and four connected to my arm. I looked around the room and the instrumentation connected to my body told me I was in ICU. My wife was curled up in a chair by the window sleeping and again I felt a mild annoyance but couldn't remember momentarily why I was annoyed at her. The nurse suddenly noticed I was awake and spoke. Good morning, Mr. Carter. How are you feeling this morning? Groggy. I managed to rasp out. My throat felt dry. Well take a drink of this and you'll feel better. She told me as she held a straw to my lips and I took a swallow of water. The noise of our talking must have wakened my wife. Jack, are you all right, sweetheart? I'm so sorry for what happened. What had happened? I wondered in my fuzzy mental state. I tried to recollect anything from my memory that would explain what had happened and why I was here. Suddenly, I remembered the previous evening and what had instigated a rage that I couldn't control. It was like a light bulb had been turned on in a darkened room. You bitch. I suddenly screamed at my wife. Get the hell out of my sight. My wife looked at me with horror on her face. Alarm bells were going off around me and the nurse was suddenly in a panic trying to get me to calm down. Mr. Carter, please calm down. Mrs. Carter, you're going to have to leave immediately. The nurse said to my wife as she adjusted a valve on the floor and within a few seconds I slid back into my comfortable dark hole. The last thing I remembered was my wife sobbing and leaving the ICU. When I awoke again it must have been about midday as the room was filled with sunlight and I heard my older son, David's voice. When can we find out how he is physically? The family is really concerned about his mental condition too. He should be waking soon, the doctor responded, and as soon as that happens we'll get him started on some tests to determine the condition of his heart and his other vital signs. We should have a feel for his physical condition later this afternoon. As far as his mental condition, I would suggest you, or some member of the family, except Mrs. Carter, sit down and talk with him. From what I'm told, he's had a severe reaction to your mother, so we're asking her to stay away until this problem in their marriage can be resolved. It might require a psychiatrist or marriage counselor to resolve the marital issues that seem to be bothering your father, but we need to determine his physical state first. All right, doctor. Thanks a lot. I'll be the spokesperson for the family in place of my mother. I understand, the doctor said as he turned toward my bed. Oh, good, Mr. Carter. I see you're awake. We'll start the testing right away. Dad, how are you doing? Can I get you anything? Yes, you can keep your mother to hell and gone away from me and tell John Masters I want to see him as soon as possible. John Masters, your lawyer? Okay, Dad, if that's what you want. I'll try to get him to see you tomorrow, but you need to explain this to us. Mom is almost having a nervous breakdown. I know, son, and I'll try to talk with you later about it. How did this all start? Why am I so angry at my wife of 25 years? I have to go back 12 years when I discovered that my wife was having an affair. It just about destroyed me that the person I loved most in the world would betray me and our children. At the time, I thought we were happily married with three wonderful kids, David age 12, Sandra age 10, and Michael age 7. I had a good job, and my very beautiful wife Ginger, age 35, worked part-time at a bank as a teller. Prior to my discovery of her infidelity, I had sensed something was wrong in our marriage, and then I noted the odd clues that made me suspicious. Our sex life had dropped off to near zero, and then looking in her purse for our checkbook, I discovered a motel receipt dated the previous Tuesday while I was out of town on business. Looking further in her purse, I found a pack of condoms with two missing hidden in a secret compartment, which I found by feeling around the purse lining. This prompted me to look into our household finances while she was at work one Saturday morning. She normally looked after the finances and paid the bills, so I would not have a reason to look into our records. I found that billings on one of our credit cards showed charges two times the previous month for the same motel out near the airport. 
Dates coincided with times I was out of town on business. If she was meeting a lover, I wondered why the hell she was paying for the room. Was her lover another woman? I also found her cell phone billings and found a number that had been consistently called that I didn't recognize. This was more than suspicion now, and I felt my chest begin to tighten, and I felt nauseous, so I went into the bathroom and sat on the toilet seat to see if the feelings would pass. While I waited, I thought, is she really cheating on me? Why would she do it? Don't I give her enough of my love? Our sex life was good, I thought. I was tormenting myself with unknowns. I had to find the truth. After a while, the feelings of nausea and stress passed, and I determined I would have to be careful in the future, or I'd have a heart attack. I made an appointment to see our lawyer, John Masters, the following Tuesday. I didn't say anything to Ginger, but tried to act normal. However, when she indicated she wanted sex, I couldn't respond to her and blamed it on the pressure of a new project at work. She seemed to accept that and appeared happy just to snuggle against me. On Tuesday, I took off from work and went to see John. He was surprised that Ginger might be involved in an affair, but he did recommend that to be sure and have sufficient evidence of adultery. I should hire a licensed private investigator to collect the necessary information and pictures to support my assertions. He also advised me off my limited rights regarding custody of the children and recommended that it might be cheaper and better for the kids if I confronted her and got her to stop the affair to hold the marriage and family together. I agreed to take all he told me into consideration but would go ahead and have a private investigator document the affair. He thought that it would probably be prudent to do it and gave me the address and phone number of a private investigator he would vouch for. As soon as I got back to my office, I called and made an appointment to see the investigator, Sam Davis, the next day. Sam proved to be a sharp individual and when I told him about the evidence I found, he indicated that I might have need for my suspicions. Noting that the supposed tryst with a lover happened on days I was out of town, he asked when my next trip was scheduled. I told him that I was scheduled to be in Denver for a meeting on the following Tuesday and would be leaving Monday morning and returning on Wednesday. Seeing as only one motel was involved in the previous supposed tryst, he would concentrate his attention there, but have an associate follow her to make sure starting from the time I left on Monday. He also wanted permission to tap our home phone and to play sound-activated audio recorders in her car and in the house. Then he asked if my wife knew about my upcoming trip, and I told him I'd just found out about it that morning and hadn't had an opportunity to tell Ginger yet. In that case, he told me he wanted immediate access to her car and her house to install the recording devices, and I was not to tell her until he had them planted. I knew she was at work and her car would be in the bank parking lot, so we headed over there right away. He placed the sound-activated recorder under the driver's seat. Then we headed for our house where he tapped our phone and had several wireless mini mics around the house with a receiver and recording device in an unlocked shed behind our house. This way, he told me, he could have an associate pick up the recordings daily while my wife was away from the house. I gave him a spare key to Ginger's car when he asked and said an associate would replace the tapes there periodically. When he was done, he took down the number I discovered in Ginger's cell phone log and said he'd check out who had the number. I then returned to work after he told me he'd be in touch. That night after dinner, I told Ginger about my planned business trip, and she acted sad that I'd be away again. I noticed that the tight feeling in my chest and my feeling of nausea was with me constantly now. I proceeded on with my life as normal while waiting to hear from Sam. If she was acting the loving wife, I would have to act the loving husband. That weekend, I had sex with Ginger to keep her from becoming suspicious. What brought that on, sweetheart? We haven't had sex like that since before the kids were born. I thought I'd let you know how much I love you and recognize how much you mean to me and the kids. I really appreciate that, Jack. Sometimes, I think I'm just being taken for granted. Anytime you feel you need a lift, honey, let me know. I appreciate everything you do to keep our marriage and our family together. Thank you, Jack, and I certainly will let you know after that. She laughed. I'm going to miss you while you're gone. Keep me in your thoughts while you're away. I don't want you straying. Honey, I've always been faithful to you, and I don't plan to stray. That's comforting to know, sweetheart. Are you being a good girl while I'm gone? This was a moment of truth, I thought. She didn't hesitate as she responded. Yes, sweetheart. You're the only one for me. You and the kids are my sole reason to be as the saying goes. I'm glad to hear that. We have the perfect marriage and the perfect family. We should never screw it up. I agree with you 100%. Now I need to get to sleep. You tired me right out. Good night, darling. She hadn't batted an eye in her response. Maybe I had her all wrong. This coming week may tell the story, though. I tried to get to sleep, but I tossed and turned most of the night with visions of her screwing some guy in a motel room. I left for the airport Monday morning after kissing Ginger goodbye. 
As usual, I took the time to admonish our kids to behave themselves and mind their mother before leaving. After pulling away from the house, I pulled to the curb around the corner as I felt myself start to hyperventilate. I got out a paper bag I'd brought along and breathed into it. After a few moments, I was almost normally and continued on my way. While I was away, I had a hard time concentrating on business but tried to stay focused so I wouldn't have to think about what Ginger might be doing while I was gone. On the return flight, I was so apprehensive I had to go to the laboratory twice with my paper bag so I could calm my nerves. Arriving home on Wednesday evening, I tried to act natural but I think she knew something was wrong. I avoided her welcome kiss and just let her kiss me on the cheek. Is there anything bothering you, Jack? You've been acting strangely even before you left Monday. I guess it's the stress of a new project at work. I told her hoping to forego any further discussion of what may be troubling me. You've never let anything at work bother you before. This is a special project and I may get a big promotion out of it. I lied. Well, you're worrying me. Would you like to take a Valium? They help me when I feel stressed. Okay, I'll try half a one first. My thought was that they might be better and less obvious than the paperback. After taking the pill I waited and after a while I felt myself coming back under control. I breathed a sigh of relief. Is that better, Jack? Yes, much better. Thanks. Would you like to come up to bed now? I've sent the kids over to my parents for the night. It was a plain invitation for sex, but I didn't think I could respond, at least until I'd heard from the PI. And after that maybe never again. I'm really tired, honey. I'd really just like to go to sleep. Okay, honey. She did look disappointed and worried. I didn't know whether she was worried about my health or that I suspected something. Maybe the PI would find nothing was wrong and this would all go away. I woke early the next morning, showered and dressed for work. I hadn't slept too well due to nervous energy so I guess the Valium had worn off. Before leaving the house I found her pill bottle and took several Valium with me after downing another half pill. I stopped at an overnight diner and had breakfast and a cup of decaf coffee and then was ready for work. About 9 o'clock, I couldn't wait anymore and after closing the door to my office phone Sam to find out what had happened while I was gone. Sam, this is Jack Masters. What can you tell me about the last few days regarding my wife? Mr. Masters, I was just going to call you. Can you come into my office this morning and I'll give you a rundown on what we've found so far? I can be there in 15 minutes, Sam. Okay, I'll be expecting you. Taking another half Valium, I told my secretary I'd be gone for an hour and to call me on my cell phone if anything came up requiring my immediate attention. When I got to Sam's office, his secretary waved me into his office and I entered with dread. Sam stood as I entered and reached across the desk to shake my hand. I guess you're anxious to know what we found out, he said, so I'll get right to it. Your wife is having an affair, he told me without preamble. Oh God, I was afraid of that. I said as I fell back into a chair in front of his desk. I'm afraid it's more than an affair. She's totally in with her lover and appears to readily submit to him and others sexually and with pain as a primary motivator. He began to lay out a series of still photos on his desk in front of me and I saw my wife of 13 years naked on her knees in front of him, bound to a bed with a large. Finally, a picture of her with two men while she was on her knees. Now I knew why I hadn't seen her naked body for a while. I was suddenly sick and had to run from Sam's office and down the hall to a toilet where I heaved up my breakfast and more. It took some time to recover and I popped another half Valium before returning to Sam's office. His secretary looked at me sympathetically when I returned and went back to Sam. Sorry about that. I spoke. He would picked up the pictures while I was gone and placed them in an envelope. These are preliminary until I hear from you regarding how much more you want us to do. We also have a video of the entire evening on Tuesday he told me as he handed me the envelope. When you think you're done with our services, we'll prepare a final report for you and a copy for your lawyer. By the way, we found out that her master is John Harding, a vice president at the bank where she works. I was still in shock, but the Valium was keeping me calm now, and I could think with some clarity. All right, Sam, I'll let you know. Right now, I've got to sit down and think about my options. I understand. We'll be waiting to hear from you. I headed back to my office and a quiet time for soul-searching. Back in my office, I told my secretary I didn't want to be disturbed and went into my office and closed the door. I had to make a decision that would impact our marriage, my family, and our kids. I sat in my office the rest of the day without leaving, even forgetting lunch. My secretary knew something was bothering me and suspected correctly that it had to do with problems at home. She peeked in a couple of times to see how I was doing and my boss came down to talk when he'd heard I'd gone incommunicado. Jack, 
I know you've got some problems and if there's anything I can do let me know. Why don't you take the rest of the day off and go home? Thanks for your concern and offer, Jerry, but I can think better here by myself. I understand. We all wish you the best, he told me as he closed the door and left. I sat there until my normal quitting time, and by then I'd worked out in my mind what I had to do. On the way home, I took another half Valium and was quite calm when I entered our house. Ginger met me at the door and tried to kiss me, but I dodged away. Jack, she exclaimed. What's the matter? Ginger, we've got to talk. I'm going to take the kids over to your parents for a while and we can have our talk when I return. She became quite pale and looked at me with fear in her eyes, but murmured, All right, Jack. When I came back, she was sitting in her usual chair in the family room, and I went over and pulled the blinds on the windows, turned on the lights in the room, and then turned to her. Ginger, get up and take off your clothes. She looked at me shocked. What? You heard me. Get up and strip. Now. Oh God. Oh God. You know. Please don't make me do this, Jack. Please. Do it, Ginger, or I'll come over there and rip them off you. Crying and moaning, she stood and began to remove her clothes. She stopped when she was down to her bra and panties. I could see the red marks of mistreatment on her beautiful body already. All of it, Ginger. Tears were running down her face as she removed all her clothes, revealing whip and bite marks. Oh God, Ginger. How could you? How could you? I cried with tears running down my face as I looked at her. I'm so sorry, Jack. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I couldn't help it. Go get your robe and put it on. Then come back. We're going to talk and you're going to have some decisions to make. I managed to gasp out as I tried to wipe away my tears with my shirt sleeve. I could feel my chest begin to tighten again and my stomach seemed to be in a turmoil as she left the room and I went and had another half Valium. When she returned with her robe on I was starting to feel calmer. I waved her to her chair. I handed her the envelope with the pictures of her tryst and said, Look at them, you slut. See what your family, your parents, my parents and all our friends are going to see as well as the divorce court. Look at every one of them. I really didn't think she saw one of the images as she shuffled quickly through them with her body shaken by uncontrolled sobbing and her eyes flooded with tears. Oh God, oh God, what have I done? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I want you to tell me about it. I don't want the gory details. Just tell me how it started. Tell me how many other affairs you've had. Tell me if the kids are mine. Tell me if you love and want to go with your master, John Harding. Oh, Jack, I've never had another affair and I love you and want to stay with you and our kids. The kids are yours. Please don't doubt that. Don't turn me out. Help me. I need you now. I don't have any love whatever for him. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, mostly from rage. It was like a white hot ball of fire in my gut that the Valium didn't seem to alleviate. Tell me the rest and remember if I find you lied, I'll make you pay. All right. It all started six months ago when I took that three-week course for the teller's job at the bank. John Harding taught the class to me and three other women who wanted to be working part-time. I had some troubles catching on to some of the stuff he was teaching and he had me stay behind after class to tutor me after the bank closed. I was so appreciative of his willingness to give me extra time that I guess I began to let him control me and I found I liked it. I don't know why. One thing led to another, and then I began to meet him evenings while you were out of town. We met at the motel near the airport, and he began to make me pay for the room. I felt so guilty and cheap about what I was doing and wanted to stop, but he showed me a video he'd taken showing us together and what I was letting him do to me and told me he'd send it to you if I didn't do what he wanted. I'm so glad it's over. I want to get on with my life, but I need to find out why I did what I did. I really need your help, and I'm so sorry it all happened. I love you and the kids so much that I can't stand the thought of losing you. I think you've behaved so stupidly that I have a hard time believing you. How long do you think you could continue without being caught? Did you ever give any consideration to me and the kids while you were doing it? I think you're more sorry you're caught than sorry for hurting us. How can I trust you again out when I'm not around? Any man you meet would be a candidate for a new affair. Oh no, Jack. No. No. I will never do anything so stupid again. Now you're going to have to make a decision. Here are your options and I need an answer by tomorrow morning. 1. I will divorce you and take full custody of the children. If you don't agree to full custody and limited visitation rights, I will release the PI's report with all the pictures to all our family and friends and let the world know what a slut you are. You are then free to continue your affair with your master. 2. I will agree not to divorce you, but you will have to agree to quit your job at the bank, give a deposition to our lawyer on what you've done, and agree to certain restrictions on your future activities. 
I'm giving you this option very reluctantly, but our children are still young enough that they need a mother, and you are the best candidate. I will not make the PI report public, but will hold it as a guarantee of you future faithfulness and respect for me. I also want you to have yourself checked for STDs. Oh, thank you, sweetheart, for giving me another chance. You won't be sorry. I don't want your answer now. I want it in the morning after you've had a chance to sleep on it. You'll be sleeping in the spare room tonight and for the foreseeable future. All right, Jack. I understand. I hope you do. The next morning, I was down early after a sleepless night. When I did fall asleep, I'd had nightmares where I was standing in a high balcony overlooking a bedroom and watching as Ginger had taken on a series of men. I couldn't find a way down to stop her and I'd wake up in a cold sweat. I must have cried out because twice times Ginger had knocked on the door asking if everything was okay. When she left I heard her sobbing as she moved down the hall back to our spare room. I was sitting in the kitchen having a cup of decaf coffee before going back upstairs to shower and get ready for work when Ginger entered. She had an old nightgown on and her robe and looked like she hadn't slept much either. I just stared at her without otherwise acknowledging her as she came up to me and looked into my eyes. Jack, I cannot tell you how sorry I am, but I can't keep telling you that for the rest of my life. I can only show you that I mean it. I want to accept your offer to allow me to stay with you as your wife. I accept any conditions you want to make regarding my future activities, and I will call and quit my job at the bank effective immediately. You understand that you will be my wife in name only. I do not plan to have sex with you, and you will be staying in the spare room indefinitely. As far as I am concerned, you will be the live and maid and the caregiver of my children. You will receive a weekly stipend as a maid and an allowance to purchase groceries and other items needed to run the home. I understand and I will make up some excuse to tell the kids why I'm sleeping in the spare room. Good. I'm going to get ready for work. Sweetheart, can I make you some breakfast before you go? By the way, you have lost the right to call me sweetheart or any other terms of endearment. My name is Jack and yes... You may have breakfast ready for me when I come down. I understand, Jack. When I got to work, I called Sam and told him to discontinue any further activities on my case and asked how long it would take to get a final report on what he'd found so far. He said he would have it completed that afternoon as everything was already in his computer, including the photos. Immediately after finishing it, he would have a copy sent to me and one to my lawyer, John Masters, via courier. For some reason I didn't know about at the time, I asked him to not to reference anything about the video he had taken of my wife at her tryst in his report, but to forward it to me. He agreed to do that and didn't question my motives as he had enough evidence with the still photos to support the report's conclusions. I then called John Masters and updated him on what Sam had found out and that a copy of the report would be at his office later today. We made an appointment for me and Ginger to be at his office the following day after he'd had a chance to read it. John. I want you to look at the report with the thought that I'd like to go after the bank and John Harding. I'm bringing Ginger tomorrow so you can listen to her story and to provide her deposition for any case that we pursue. Okay, Jack. I'll read the report when it gets here and be in a position to discuss it tomorrow when you get here. The rest of the day, I made some phone calls canceling joint credit cards and took my lunch hour to move accounts to another bank in my name only from the one Ginger had worked. I also set up our savings in my father's name as a trust fund for the children. When I got home that night, I brought my copy of the report with me and after dinner, while the kids were busy doing homework, I sat down with her in the family room and showed it to her. I did not mention anything about a video as I'd stopped at our new bank on my way home and rented a safe deposit box for it. Ginger sobbed as she thumbed through it and realized how thoroughly it had been prepared to document her adultery. I don't know what to say, Jack. I just want you to know what I will have in a safe deposit box if you fail me again. I understand. I want you to be at John Master's office tomorrow morning at 10 and be prepared to make a deposition about your affair with John Harding. You also need to find the name of a good psychiatrist and make an appointment to get in to see him as soon as possible. Yes, I'll be there and I'll do anything you say. I want you to know I called the bank today and quit my job. I did not try to contact John Master's at all. I also got the name of a psychiatrist today and the earliest I could get in to see him will be next week. All right. My chest still felt tight and I was still popping the Valium periodically to try to keep things under control. I was beginning to feel depressed and very sad. That night I had more nightmares and determined that I may need the help of a psychiatrist myself before this affair all played out. The next day I took off from work at quarter to tend to meet with John and Ginger, who was driving her own car to John's office. I had told my boss that I was having some personal problems that needed to be resolved and he understood and told me to take the rest of the day off if I needed it. 
When I got to John's office the next morning, I found Ginger in the waiting room, and together we went in to see him. John greeted us and waved us to chairs facing the desk. I've read the PI's report, and now I need to talk with Ginger to determine what sort of a case we might have to pursue a case against the bank, John Harding, and any other individuals that might have been involved in it. So why don't you tell me about it, Ginger? Ginger looked at me. You're going to pursue a case against John and the bank? I'm going to try to destroy John Harding and the bank should pay because it all started in their classroom. Ginger quietly turned away and her shoulders shook as though she were sobbing. After a few minutes, she turned back and said, I'm ready to tell you about it. Tears were running down her face and John handed her a box of tissues to use. After she dried her eyes, she began to tell John essentially the same story she'd told me before. When she was done, John thought a moment before speaking. I think we have a case to pursue against the bank and John Harding and anyone else who may have been involved, especially if they were also employees of the bank. First, Ginger, I need your signed deposition. I'll go over a few points you need to emphasize and then I'll turn you over to my secretary and she'll transcribe your story and then we'll have you sign it and she'll notarize your signature. Then I can proceed to have the bank, John Harding and persons unknown served with the necessary papers. We'll go in for about a $10 million judgment, but I must warn you the leverage they will try use is publicity, but they will be just as anxious to avoid some publicity on this as we are. We'll also proceed to get John Harding fired and the return of any photos or videos he has. After waiting to get Ginger's deposition completed, I returned to work. I thought about going home, but I didn't want to be alone with Ginger. When I thought about her, I felt the rage build up again, and I just couldn't face looking at her or being with her. I began to seriously think about a separation as the best answer to our problem, but our children deserved a family and I vowed to stick it out even though I knew I was going into a mental condition caused by rage and depression. For the next two months we lived together, and even though the rage abetted I found myself coping with bouts of depression that at times left me almost incapacitated. I had to take a leave of absence from work. As Ginger started with her psychiatrist, I began to go to one myself. It took another two months before he was able to get my medication adjusted to where I could almost function almost normally again and return to work. I know the children suffered because of my condition and the poor relationship I had with their mother. So our lives together went on and after a year it had improved to the point where Ginger was sharing our bed again, although we didn't try to have sex for a month or more. I found myself impotent with her when I tried to initiate intercourse, but after the doctor prescribed Viagra we were able to have sex again. Eventually, we managed to settle into a normal husband-slash-wife relationship, and I could give up my dependence on Viagra. Our family interrelationships began to return to normal. In the meantime, our lawyer, John Masters, pursued legal action against the bank and John Harding. The outcome was that an out-of-court settlement of $3 million was negotiated with the bank. The bank fired John Harding, and his wife divorced him. We received a judgment against him for half million dollars, and he had to move away and start a new life in another state so he could find another job and pay his alimony and child support. I took the money we received from the bank in Harding and put most of it into a trust for the children and named John Masters as administrator. Eventually, I was able to reduce my medications for depression and anxiety, and we started marriage counseling. Ginger found out from her psychiatrist what some of the causes were in getting involved with John Harding and learned how to guard against letting submissiveness trap herself into a similar situation in the future. After a few years, our marriage resumed the comfortable relationship we had known before her affair, though I kept closer tabs on her activities than before. Ginger never went back to work. As we approached our 25th wedding anniversary, our eldest son, David, had graduated from college, was married, and had given us a grandson, Eric. Ginger and I were both doting grandparents. Sandra was a senior in college and Michael was a freshman. We were proud of our children and their accomplishments. It was a couple of weeks before our 25th anniversary that I noticed a subtle change in her behavior and activities. I couldn't believe she would was involved in another affair after all these years. Our sex life was still good, I thought. I tried to give her her share of orgasms, so why would she stray? I began to watch her more carefully and I began by checking her email account. Though it appeared she'd made some attempt to hide it, I discovered emails from someone named Charles thanking her for something she'd done for him and begging her to meet him for a proper thank you. Her responses were initially non-committal, but he persisted until she finally agreed to meet him at a hotel room on the Saturday evening before our anniversary, which fell on the following Monday. He told her he'd reserved room 524 at the hotel and would meet her there at 6.30 p.m. My old chest pains were developing again as well as my depression and my rage. How and why would she be unfaithful to me again? 
I'd already made reservations for the two of us for an anniversary dinner on the Monday evening, and I began to think of it as a farewell dinner for our marriage. I decided I wouldn't hire a PI this time, but just go and confront her with her lover at the hotel, then go from there. Saturday morning, she told me that she had to go to the hospital that evening for a couple of hours to visit a sick friend. Trying to act as natural as I could, I acknowledged her information with a nod and went back to reading the morning paper. The day passed slowly and I had to dig around until I found my old container of Valium to keep myself calm. About 6 o'clock, Ginger took off and after waiting half an hour, I followed her to the hotel. When I got there, I mulled how I was going to gain entry to the room she was using. I found an old baseball cap and jacket in the trunk of my car and took it with me and went into the hotel. It was an upscale hotel and sold cut flowers in the shop off the lobby. I bought a large bouquet and took the elevator to the fifth floor. Finding room 524, I donned the cap and jacket and holding the flowers in front of my face, I knocked on the door. I felt my heart pounding in my chest as I waited. I was a nervous wreck. Who is it? I heard my wife ask through the door. Flower delivery, ma'am. I answered, trying to disguise my voice. I heard the door unlatch, and she looked out and said, I didn't order any flowers. You must. About that time, I dropped the flowers and pushed my way into the room. Where is he? I demanded. Oh, Jack, you're right on time. There isn't anyone. I just did that to get you down here. The kids are putting on an anniversary dinner for us tonight, and they wanted to surprise you. Now put on your suit on the bed there. I remember going over and looking in the bath to confirm that she was alone, and then I spun around to look at her as she stood looking at me with a smile on her face. My mind was numb for a few seconds, and then something snapped, and I felt a rage building up that seemed to overwhelm me. What the hell had she done? She knew the problems I'd had years ago getting over her affair. Why did she use a similar situation to get me down here? Just as I was about to lay into her, everything started to go black, and I felt myself falling and sliding into a deep hole. I heard Ginger cry, Jack, before everything went black. So now it was the next day, and I was in an ICU unit at the local hospital. I was introduced to a series of tests that morning, and while I waiting to hear the results I visited with my son, David. Sandra and Michael were home looking after their mother. Dad, mom is being sedated. She doesn't understand why you're mad at her and why you won't see her. David, I'm seriously considering divorcing your mother. That's why I want to talk with John Masters. Why, Dad? Why? What did she do to make you want to do that? Do you know how your mother got me to the hotel? No, she just said she'd get you there. Before I begin the story, can you tell me how come your mother was brought in on the anniversary dinner plans? She found out when Michael inadvertently left the folder with our hotel price quotes and other material that pretty much told what we were planning. So we decided to surprise you anyway. She said she'd be responsible to have you in the banquet room by 7 o'clock. So we left that part up to her. Well, it all goes back to when you were 12 years old. You didn't know it at the time, but I discovered your mother had an affair that was very sordid. Subsequent to that, I had essentially a complete mental breakdown and was out of work and in therapy for months. I was thankful that the company where I work held on to my job until I could get back on my feet. I never really forgave your mother for that, but over time we become fairly comfortable with one another again. I used to have almost uncontrollable rages against your mother and at times despaired of resuming a relationship together and it's taken a long time to get over it. In order to get me down here, your mother decided to invent a new lover that she was going to have a tryst with at the hotel Saturday evening. I fell for it. And when I went to the hotel room to confront her and her lover, all my old mental troubles and now possibly heart problems have appeared. I'm so mad at her that if I weren't sedated, I'd probably die or kill her. I can only assume that your mother, being a normal rational individual, had to realize what would happen and was hoping I'd have a heart attack and leave her with all our assets and no one alive to tell about her affair. Gosh, Dad, we were never aware of this. I remember when I was a kid you were sick for a long time. I didn't know until now what the problem was. It's hard to believe she would deliberately do something like you're suggesting, but I can't see how she could ignore your previous problems. Well, if I go for a divorce, I plan to bring out the whole story for the world to know, but I will give your mother a chance to tell me in a few days why she tried to get me up to that hotel room that way. There were other options she could have used to accomplish the same thing. Dad, I hope this doesn't have to come to a divorce. I hope you think about it rationally. I guess it's going to depend on how rational a story your mother gives me. Later that day, the cardiologist came to the ICU. My son, Michael, was with me. Mr. Carter, I have good news. Your heart is fine, and we can move you into a regular room for the night, and you can go home tomorrow. It appears that you've had some sort of shock to your system that caused you to pass out. 
From your records, it looks like you have a history of mental stress, and you should probably seek psychiatric help to determine the cause of your problem. If you continue to have the stress you're under, you're apt to develop some heart problems. Thanks, doctor. Going home is a mixed blessing in my case because that's where the source of my problem resides also. Well, you will have to work that out, possibly with marital counseling. I've been that route. It didn't take. All right then, but as far as my professional opinion is concerned, you're physically able to leave the hospital. You should find a way to avoid a repetition of what caused your problem. Thank you for your assistance, doctor. After the doctor left, I turned to Michael and asked, Do you know whether David got hold of John Masters? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Dad. Mr. Masters will see you as soon as you're able. I'll call John right now and see if I can get in to see him tomorrow morning after I've checked out of the hospital. I said as I reached for the phone. I was able to make an appointment with John for 10 o'clock the following morning. Then the nurse arrived and began to get me ready to be moved out of the ICU. After checking out the next morning, David drove me to John Master's office where we went into conference with him. I hear you've had some of your old problems come back, Jack. He told me after our greeting. Yes, and now I'm going to have to do something about it. I thought I'd put the early episode to bed, but she's done something that's brought it all back, and I'm not sure but that she did it deliberately. Then I told him what had occurred to cause my problems. So, what do you want to do, Jack? I'd like you to start proceedings toward a divorce on the grounds of adultery. Adultery? Do you have some new evidence that she's having another affair? No, I want to proceed based on the affair she had 13 years ago. I don't know whether the judge will go along with that, Jack. You've been living with Ginger for 13 years now in what he would assume is a harmonious marriage. He would most likely reject the petition for divorce based on lack of current evidence to the contrary. I don't care. I want to make it part of the public record about her infidelity and expose the sordid details of her affair. If it's turned down, we can try for a divorce on or separation on other grounds, but I want to cause her some pain. She got out of her affair when I caught her 13 years ago because I felt the kids needed a mother and a family and I didn't want to release the details of her affair because of what it would do to the family. The only pain she suffered was short-lived, but I suffered for years before I could get back to a normal life. Now she's brought it all back and I want to cause her pain because of the things she just did and for her affair. The kids are old enough now where custody isn't an issue anymore and are old enough where the details of her affair won't traumatize them. This could be very expensive, Jack. Are you sure you want to proceed this way? I'm very sure, but I'm going home now to confront Ginger and unless she's got a good explanation for her recent actions, I will want to proceed. I don't know what she could say that would justify her actions, but I will listen. Unless you hear from me, please continue it toward a divorce based on her previous adultery. Okay, Jack. I'll go with your instructions. Thanks, John. We left John's office and headed home to meet with Ginger. When we arrived at the house, Sandra and Michael met us outside and we all went into the house together. Ginger was sitting in the living room waiting for us. She looked like hell I thought and was glad to see her in pain finally. I waved the kids to seats as I spoke to her without going near her. Hello, Ginger. I said as I sat in a chair across from her. I tried to remain calm and unemotional. Hello, Jack. She responded with tears running down her face and then continued, David has told me why you're mad at me and what you want to hear from me. I wish I had some rational reason for what I did. I should have known better, but I didn't. I was just thinking about it as a big joke that we could laugh about later. I can only ask that you forgive me for not using better judgment in doing what I did. I just didn't anticipate the repercussions of my actions. Ginger, your big joke could have killed me and I cannot help but think it was deliberately done with that thought in mind. Oh no, Jack. Please don't say or think that. I love you and looked forward to growing old together with you. Why would I want to kill you? You have a funny way of showing love for someone. I see your motive for doing it as a way to ensure keeping the details of your previous affair secret forever if I were gone and you would then have our marriage assets to yourself. You could then pursue your kinky sexual urges without remorse. Oh no, Jack. Please don't accuse me of that. Not in front of the kids. I have no inclination to get involved in kinky sex again, and I don't have need for more money. I do hope that the report of my affair never comes to light, but I would never try to kill you to keep it secret. The kids are old enough now to know about our problems so they can avoid our mistakes in their future. The thing is I can't keep going through a life worrying about you having another affair, and I keep thinking that I, as the wrong party in all this, have taken the brunt of the hurt for your actions. Maybe I'm coming across as doing this for revenge, and maybe that's what I need for closure. But you so wantonly forgot the difficulties I experienced after your affair and the months and years of therapy I went through to overcome it, that it just about blows my mind that you would do what you did. 
I am giving you credit for a modicum of intelligence that you should have realized what a repeat of that could do to me. That is why I believe you deliberately planned it. You have not convinced me it was an accident, and so I'm instructing John Masters to pursue getting a divorce from you based on adultery. I would recommend you get yourself a lawyer. Adultery? Jack, I haven't been with anyone else since my affair. I swore I'd be faithful to you and I have. I'm going to base the claim of adultery on your affair 13 years ago. Oh please Jack, don't do that. I'll give you a divorce, if that's what you want, under any other conditions, but don't make it based on something I did 13 years ago. It would kill me to have that report made public. I'm sorry, Ginger, but that's the way it's going to be. I want you to suffer some real pain. Have your lawyer contact John Masters. I'm going to pack a few things and move to a motel until I can locate an apartment. Then I'll come back and get the rest of my stuff. Do you kids want to say anything about this? I asked as I looked at each of them. I'd like to say something that I think will sum it up for the three of us. David said, Dad, I'm afraid you're being very vengeful to base a divorce on something that happened 13 years ago and Mom, I cannot see how you could accidentally do something so stupid. That said, we wish the whole thing had never happened. I'll regret trying to set up a surprise anniversary dinner for you for the rest of my life. I hate to think I or any of us had a hand in your splitting. Maybe, when the dust has settled again you both can find a way to get together again. David, I said. What you attempted to do was commendable and appropriate for the occasion. Please kids, don't hold yourself to blame for it. It may have happened anyway at some other time. Now I'm going up the pack. As I went upstairs Ginger sat quietly crying and our kids were trying to console her. Later, I drove in my car to a motel near my work where I settled for what I hoped would only be a week's stay before finding a more permanent place. The confrontation was over and things were staring to reach a finale to 25 years of a marriage gone bad. In the days following my confrontation with Ginger, I found a furnished apartment near my work and moved in immediately. Then I went to my old home and picked up the rest of my personal clothing and other items and moved them to my apartment. Ginger sat in the kitchen while I was there, and we didn't speak to one another. She just sat there and looked drawn and weary. A week after I moved out, John presented the petition for divorce to the court and a hearing date was set. A legal notice went into the local newspaper and I heard many of our friends who were unaware of our split were calling our house asking Ginger what was going on. The kids said she spent much of her time crying and began to avoid answering the phone. Somehow, I felt satisfaction that she was starting to feel some pain. At the divorce hearing, the judge approved my divorce petition based on adultery. The kids were angry and did not speak to me for the next two years. Ginger was given the house and the divorce settlement, and she sold it immediately and moved to a condominium. I heard that she seldom went out and was almost a recluse. She didn't date in her newfound freedom and hardly saw any of our old friends. Her mother and father and our kids were her only real contacts with the outside world. To me, it was all closure to a bad episode in my life, and though missing the camaraderie of marriage, I felt content. I often wonder, though, if I went too far to give her pain. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.